Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today we are checking out how the Intel Core i9-9900K performs when paired with DDR4 4000 memory. This is a test that quite a few of you have been requesting uh, for some time now. I've been a bit slack, but I've got my hands on some 4000 memory. That's around here somewhere. I'll find it in a moment. Doesn't really matter. But anyway, I've put it to the test. Uh, I've actually done a bit more than just test with just the 4000 speed. It's more of a I suppose you'd call it a memory scaling benchmark, this one. Uh, I've tested a number of games and applications uh, at memory speeds ranging from 2400, which is just below spec, uh, of course 2666, which is the spec, uh, right up to 4000. There's about eight memory speeds in total. So yeah, lots of interesting results to go over. But before we do, Today's video has been sponsored by ASRock and the new Phantom Gaming range of Z390 motherboards. The Z390 Phantom Gaming 6 and 9 include a blazing fast 2.5 gigabits per second network interface, offering gamers and content creators two and a half times the bandwidth compared to standard gigabit ethernet. For more information, please check the link in the video description. Okay, so over the past month, I've noticed quite a few viewers asking us to run uh, some tests on the 900K using DDR4 4000 memory. I've also noticed quite a few people interested in memory scaling uh, so they can work out where the sweet spot is in terms of memory frequency. So I thought, why not just do both at once? Kill two birds with the one stick of memory, as they say. <coughs> G-Skill recently sent over a 16 gigabyte kit of their Trident Z Royal uh, DDR4 memory. I haven't actually taken the plastic off these ones. Uh, anyway, this is, or these modules rather, are rated at the 4000 speed using CL17 timings. That's probably shining all over the place. I should be careful where I aim these. Uh, anyway, so for this test, I will be taking ASRock's Z390 uh, Tai Chi Ultimate, a Gigabyte's RTX 2080 Ti Aorus Extreme, the 900K, of course, and then G-Skills Bling Fest memory that could potentially blind people depending on the angle that I aim this stuff on. Anyway, we're gonna see how that impacts performance at a range of clock frequencies. In total, there are eight memory configurations, all of which use the same CL17 timing. So we're really just looking at the difference that the memory speed or memory frequency has here. Uh, the 9900K isn't overclocked, but that won't really impact the results. And yeah, I think that's about everything. So let's get into those blue bar graphs. Before we get into the games, of which there are just a few, let's go over some memory bandwidth results and then check out a couple of applications. Looking at the IDA64 read bandwidth results, we see that the increase in memory speed translates to a similar percentage gain. For example, DDR4-2666 is clocked 11% higher than DDR4-2400, and we saw a 12% boost in memory bandwidth. The margin of error is likely responsible for that extra percent. Then we see from 2666 to 3000, it's a 12.5% frequency bump, and the bandwidth is increased by 11.5%. This kind of scaling is pretty much seen right up to the 4000 spec. It's not quite as efficient, but some decent scaling is seen at the high end. Typically, I test Intel processors with DDR4 3200 memory, though it's CL14 stuff, and that allows for a bandwidth of roughly 50 gigabytes per second in this test. So somewhere between CL17, DDR4 3400, and 3600 then. Still, with DDR4-4000, there is a 12% memory bandwidth increase to be had, so it will be interesting to see what kind of impact this has on performance. Before we jump into the application benchmarks, here's just another quick look at some memory bandwidth results, though this time I will be using Sysoft Sandra 2016's memory bandwidth test. ADA64 reports the peak bandwidth, whereas Sysoft reports sustained bandwidth. Overall, though, despite the numbers being lower, the margins are much the same. As we found in the past, memory bandwidth doesn't impact 3D rendering applications all that much, and once again we see that here with Cinebench R15, going all the way from DDR4 2400 to DDR4 4000 boosted the score by just 2%, a measly 2% increase there. It's a similar story when testing with Blender. Here the DDR4 4000 memory reduced the rendering time by just 1.4%, shaving just 10 seconds off the completion time when compared to DDR4 2400. So despite an almost 60% increase in memory bandwidth, less than a 2% performance boost was seen. The margins are ever so slightly better in Corona, but even so, for those running rendering applications, the increased bandwidth really isn't required. This is one of the reasons why the Threadripper 2990WX does so well in these rendering applications. Typically, this is a CPU that's bandwidth starved with all cores active, but in the rendering applications that aren't bandwidth intensive, it does do very well. 
That said, we also see when encoding that the extra memory bandwidth isn't that useful, though it is substantially more useful when compared to what we just saw in the rendering applications. DDR4-4000 offers a 7% boost over the 2400 stuff. Uh, far from impressive, but like I said, it's better than a 2% boost that we saw in the rendering applications. For those of you who regularly compress archives or files, the increased memory bandwidth will be greatly appreciated. We basically see perfect scaling here. For an almost 60% increase in bandwidth, we see an almost 60% increase in performance when going from DDR4 2400 to 4000. Still as good as the compression performance was when it comes to decompression work, uh, the increased memory bandwidth is next to useless. We're back to single digit gains here. Okay, so enough applications, time for a few quick game benchmarks. And first up we have Strange Brigade, a well-optimized title that mostly taxes the GPU. It's not at all a CPU demanding title, so I wasn't surprised to find that the increased memory bandwidth had little impact on performance. The 1% low frame time performance is slightly improved as the RAM frequency is ramped up, but it's certainly nothing to write home about. And with just a 3% increase in performance from DDR4 3000 to 4000, uh, you just get the cheaper stuff. That said, trying out a more CPU demanding title such as the NPC Heavy Hitman 2 provides us with slightly more favourable results for the higher clocked memory. That said, even here DDR4-4000 was just 14% faster than DDR4-3000, we're looking at frame time performance. I'd say DDR4-3400 looks to be the sweet spot here, and I'd say the CL14 DDR4-3200 memory I typically use provides marginally better results. One of the most demanding tiles of 2018 was Shadow of the Tomb Raider, and here we find pretty solid gains right up to DDR4 3800, at least when looking at the frame time performance. Overall, I'd say DDR4 3400 is the sweet spot, while the 3600 result would be comparable to the low latency 3200 memory. The real performance hit comes when using DDR4 2400, which is below the official spec, while 2666 is the official spec. In fact, anything slower than DDR4 3200 using CL17 timings really does leave a lot of performance on the table, at least with an RTX 2080 Ti at this resolution using these quality settings, and I'll address that in a moment. Okay, so here's the last gaming benchmark we're going to look at, Battlefield 5. And what we have here is another CPU demanding title. Here at 1080p, we continue to see performance gains as the memory frequency is increased, though DDR4 3400 does once again appear to be the sweet spot, while frame time performance really did drop off with DDR4 3000. But so far, I've only tested at 1080p with an RTX 2080 Ti. So what does memory scaling performance look like at what I suppose you would call a more realistic resolution for such a beastly GPU? Well, at 1080p we saw a 34% improvement in frame time performance when going from DDR4 2400 to 4000, and now at 1440p that margin is reduced to just 7%. So yeah, quite a change there. We really are reaching the point of diminishing returns with I'd say DDR4 3200. Then if you plan to play at the 4K resolution with the RTX 2080 Ti, well, you don't really need to worry about memory speed. It basically has zero impact on performance. Here you're entirely GPU limited, even in a taxing title such as Battlefield 5. Okay, so there you have it. Memory scaling performance with the Intel Core i9-9900K. In short, for most applications and games, memory speed has little impact. Uh, granted, you don't want to be running below spec with DDR4 2400 memory. We just included that out of interest. I'd say the sweet spot somewhere between 3000 to 3400. Uh, 3400 would certainly be sufficient even with looser timings. For 16 gigabytes of DDR4-4000 memory, you're looking at having to spend at least $220 US. Meanwhile, DDR4-3000 memory starts at just under half that value, and for around $120 US, you can land yourself a CL16 DDR4-3200 kit. If you're a gamer, the Battlefield 5 1440p results are probably the most telling. This is the kind of scaling you can typically expect to see. For example, if you have a GTX 1070 and you're playing at 1080p, you'll see very similar memory scaling results. Then outside of gaming, it becomes very application dependent, and even then, what you're doing with the application can also determine how useful the extra memory bandwidth really is. It seems like for 3D rendering and encoding work, the extra bandwidth goes largely unused, but again, you will want to research how memory bandwidth impacts your particular workload. Overall, as I said uh, just a moment ago, I recommend DDR4 3000 to 3400, as that stuff really is going to provide you with the most bang for your buck, uh, while anything faster, as we saw, is likely going to end up being a waste of money uh, under realistic gaming conditions. Maybe some scenarios where it's beneficial, but I think for the most part, and most of you won't be able to take advantage of it. 
Uh, typically for around $100, $240, you're looking at CL16 to CL17 memory. Again, we tested with CL17 stuff in this video. Uh, and as was the case with frequency, uh, spending big to get low latency memory, you know, CL15, CL14, uh, possibly even lower, it's not really going to be worth it. I mean, just quickly before I wrap this up, a bit of a fun look back. Uh, at the start of 2018, I made a video series called Why Building a Gaming PC Right Now is a Bad Idea. It's quite a depressing time there for PC gamers. And part one talked about DDR4 memory prices, which along with pretty much everything else, uh, was sky high at the time. So back in January, the cheapest uh, 16 gigabyte DDR4 kit that I was able to find online cost $170 US. So today we're looking at basically half that figure. So yeah, it's fair to say prices have dropped. They may not have uh, dropped as low as we would like, but they've definitely dropped. And I did predict in January of 2018 that it would be about this time that we would see memory prices start to drop back down towards what we'd seen in 2017. So yeah, it seems I got a bit lucky on that call. This means you probably shouldn't expect DDR4 memory pricing to fall anytime soon, certainly not till much later in the year. The construction of new fabs is underway to help the strain supply, but they won't be ready for mass production until 2019 at the earliest. That's predicted by Gartner that DDR4 pricing will crash in 2019. History would suggest this is likely to happen as it's the sort of cycle we go through every few years with memory pricing. And with that, I am going to end this one. Hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, please hit the like button, subscribe for more content just like this. And if you appreciate the work at Home Box, then consider supporting us on Patreon. Thanks for watching. I'm your host, Steve. See you next time.